Afternoon, everyone. Happy Monday. Start with you are all you are all very chipper on a Monday, uh, appropriately chipper. Um, let me start with some opening comments. The United States remains deeply concerned by the ongoing anti-democratic actions of the Georgian government, which are incompatible with membership norms in the EU and NATO. In addition to the passage of the so-called foreign influence law, we have also seen the Georgian government repeatedly violently crack down on Georgian citizens who protested that law. Today, the United States is imposing sanctions on two Georgian government officials and two leaders of a violent extremist group, as well as imposing visa restrictions on more than 60 Georgian individuals for their involvement in human rights abuses, corrupt practices, or other anti-democratic actions. These actions come as a result of our ongoing comprehensive review of all bilateral cooperation in Georgia due to persistent anti-democratic actions, as well as false statements by senior Georgian government leaders that are contrary to the spirit of our decades-long relationship with the government of Georgia. The Georgian government can recommit to its Euro-Atlantic trajectory by conducting free and fair elections, withdrawing and repealing anti-democratic legislation, and demonstrating significant and measurable progress on outstanding EU accession reform recommendations. The United States has been the biggest supporter of Georgia's economic and democratic development for the past 32 years. Our assistance has focused on making Georgia stronger, more prosperous, and a more capable country, or more, uh, a country more capable of defending its sovereignty and territorial integrity. We hope that the government of Georgia will return to the path that its people so evidently desire. For that, Matt. Oh, that's it? That's it. Nothing else? That's it. You're sure? Okay. Sure. All right. <laughs> if I change my mind, I have the podium for yeah. I don't know, however long, much longer I stay okay. up here. Okay, uh, before we move on to the Middle East and Ukraine, can I just ask you, uh, is there anything more, that, uh, any detail you can provide about the release from China of this uh, American citizen uh, pastor? Uh, uh, David Lin, no, only other than that, only that we welcome David Lin's release from prison in the People's Republic of China. He has returned to the United States and reunited with his family for the first time in nearly 20 years. Okay, but that, that, that's not saying a whole lot. I mean, how, you know, this is obvious. Every time the secretary or anyone else goes to China, they've raised the, case, the cases of detained um, Americans there. Um, can you say whether you think that this his release was the result of those interventions? Uh, I'm not going to. What I will say is that you're right, Matt. Every time the secretary has uh, met with Chinese officials, whether it be in China, whether it be in here in the United States, or whether it be in other places where we've met with Chinese officials around the world, he has raised the case of David Lin and other wrongfully detained Americans, and we continue to push for the release of other wrongfully detained Americans. Um, when the, it comes to David Lin, we are uh, glad to see his release. We welcome it, and we'll continue to push for the release of other Americans. Yeah, I'm just trying to get get it. I mean, they did, did the Chinese just do this out of thin air, or was it something that you've been, you know? It's something that we have been working on for some time. I think I'll leave it at that. Um, OK. Uh, come here. Um, I'll just Sean, say, sorry, you were speaking. No, no. Humera had her hand, you had words. I'll go to Humera and come to you next. On, if they want to stay in chat. Sure. Yeah. Um, do you think that David Lin's release means anything positive about the potential release of the other Americans who are wrongfully detained in China currently? So I don't want to try to forecast one way or the other, and other than to say it's something that we continue to work on. As you know, when the secretary went to Beijing last June, uh, we were trying to restart the relationship so we could work together, not just on the big uh, issues that face the world, where we thought it was important that we have an open line of commu communication, but also a number of bilateral concerns. And one of the bilateral concerns that we have had is the wrongful detention of American citizens. And so uh, we are pleased to see David Lin's release. Uh, it's an important step forward, and we're going to continue to push for the release of other Americans. Can we just uh, follow up? Uh, sure. Can the State Department provide a number? How many Americans have been wrongfully detained in China currently? So I don't have a number here, but there are a number of Americans that are, we are still working uh, to um, see released. Mark Swyden is one. Kylie is, is, is another. 
And then, uh, can you please remind us when it was the last time Secretary Blinken met with the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi? Uh, he met with Wang Yi in Laos. Uh, I believe that was in July, the last time they had a meeting. Are they going to a meeting? I don't have any announcements to make, uh, but always, uh, obviously we always look for the opportunity to uh, meet with the foreign minister to uh, talk through a number of concerns that we have as well as areas that we can um, work together. Since we're in China, can I just yeah. stand up for President Wilson? The, um, this might be slightly in the weeds if that's not a mixed metaphor, but the Philippines and China, um, the Philippines announced that they've um, they pulled out of uh, the Escota Shoal, one of the key, uh, key parts. Do you have any... any um, uh, any take on that and what this means, whether this is uh, this this changes the equation in the South China Sea? So the Philippines has endured repeated attempts by the PRC to interfere with their freedom of navigation on the high seas near Sabina Shoal over the past uh, several months. Um, there's no legal basis for the PRC's maritime claims in the South China Sea uh, and the dangerous ways in which it attempts its, to enforce those claims put uh, Filipino lives and livelihood uh, at risk. So it is up to the Philippines to decide how they operate their vessels in areas where it enjoys the freedom of navigation in the high seas under international law. Um, and I wouldn't want to forecast what um, uh, this particular incident might mean, other than to say that we continue to support uh, our Philippine allies. Can I China? Yeah, I'll, I have a China one too. I just, Go ahead, you know, sorry, not because it's fashion, but um, are you able to rule out a swap? What do you mean? Are you able to rule out that there was no swap you, are you for, referring for the to, release to, of David Lynn? Uh, I am not going to say anything other uh, else about this process other than I've already said, which is that we welcome his release. Sometimes in diplomacy, the best, the less said, the better. Um, this is one of those occasions. Um, uh, we do welcome his release, and we're going to continue to work for the release of all wrongfully detained American citizens. Can you say at all how instrumental Secretary's meeting with Wang Yi in Laos was for, uh, uh, to secure It's the certainly uh, something that he raised in that meeting, as he has raised the wrongful detention of American citizens in all of his meetings, and as we know, other senior government officials ha have raised as well. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Janie. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions on China, Russia, and North Korea. Uh, China and Russia are conducting joint exercises near the Korean Peninsula. Do you think uh, there is a possibility that North Korea will directly or indirectly participate in these exercises? Uh, I wouldn't want to speculate. Okay, second one. Uh, last week, Russian National Security Council Sergei, uh, Secretary Sergei Shoig visited North Korea and uh, met with uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. And the Secretary Shoig requested uh, military support including weapons and manpower from North Korea in preparation for a conflict with NATO. How do you assess the expansion of cooperation between North Korea and Russia? We continue to be incredibly concerned by the expanding security relationship between uh, North Korea and Russia, both for, for the support that North Korea continues to provide to Russia to prosecute its illegal war against Ukraine, and for the prospect of, of Russia uh, assisting ways, assisting North Korea in ways that ultimately will be destabilizing to the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, North Korea. Go, go, I'll come. I just got pointed at Camilla and I'll come to Okay, yeah, go ahead then, Nike. Yeah, uh, can you please comment on the recent, uh, the Sweden's recent resumption of diplomatic operations in North Korea? Did Sweden resume its role as a protection, protecting power of underground for the United States in North Korea? on September 13, 2024. So Sweden does continue to be uh, our protective power in the DPRK. We support the return of foreign diplomats to, diplomats to Pyongyang and hope that it will reinvigorate dialogue, diplomacy, and other forms of constructive engagement with the DPRK. We also hope that the DPRK will open its borders to international humanitarian workers whose aid efforts have been hindered by the DPRK's border closures. Can you please also recap the requirements for American citizens who need to travel to North Korea? Well, I would say generally, uh, uh, generally speaking, North Korea is a level four, uh, level four country, and our advice to all Americans is not to travel to North Korea. Well, it's also illegal to use a U.S. passport that, to get, unless that, it's been specially validated. Unless it has been specially validated, correct, correct. All right. Right. Actually, I said Camilla next. So. 
you guys work it out amongst yourselves, yeah. <laughs> Already done. Um, Matt, can you give us a sense of where we are on the ceasefire talks? You guys had said about maybe a week or 10 days ago that you were a few days away from presenting a revised final whatever proposal. Um, which hasn't come through, what's uh, holding it up? We continue to engage with our uh, partners in the region, uh, most specifically with Egypt and Qatar, about um, what that proposal uh, will contain and making sure uh, or trying to see that it's a proposal that can get the parties to an ultimate agreement. Don't have a timetable uh, for you other than to say that we are working expeditiously to try to um, develop that proposal, try to find something that would bring both the parties to say yes uh, and to uh, formally submit it, but like I said, I don't have any updates on timing. It's been out there that the main sticking points are Philadelphia corridor and hostages, prisoners. Would you say those are still the main sticking points that's yeah. holding it up? Correct. Okay. Um, I promise you, Camilla, will um, go next. Thank you. Uh, so opposition leader Yaya Lapid was just here meeting with the secretary. Do you have any readout from that meeting? Uh, I don't. I haven't spoken to the secretary since the meeting. I'll be happy to cover it to, uh, in the briefing tomorrow. Okay. Um, and also Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant uh, reportedly during his meeting with um, Amos Hochstein, he said the only way left to return the re Israeli residents to the north uh, to their homes is via military action. Uh, do you have any comment on that? That sounds like things are not going well with diplomacy. So I'm not going to comment um, about the, what took place in a private meeting, certainly um, one that took place uh, among between a White House official, not a State Department official, uh, and a member of the uh, Israeli government. But we have long made clear that we believe a diplomatic solution is the correct way, um, the only way to um, bring calm to the north of Israel and allow um, Israeli citizens to return to their homes. Tens of thousands, of, there are tens of thousands of Israelis who have been um, uh, away from their homes for almost a year now. And certainly an expansion of the current conflict in the north um, is not something that would get them back to their homes uh, in the near future at all. So we'll continue to push for a diplomatic resolution. And in our conversations with Israeli officials, they have always made clear, as you, I think you've heard them say publicly on a number of occasions, that they would uh, ultimately prefer a diplomatic resolution. Can I follow up on this? Yeah. What's the current situation now on the long term? Is it the, the, the risk is higher? What's your assessment, the US assessment to that? So the, the, we continue to see strikes back and forth across the border, as you know, as you know, because you see them publicly, um, both Israel, Israel targeting uh, Hezbollah militants and Hezbollah facilities and Hezbollah infrastructure, as well as uh, Hezbollah launching rockets and drones uh, across the border. So that's something that has uh, uh, obviously was taking place before October 7th, but has really continued an at an elevated pace since October 7th. Um, and the... Um, the, the point we have continued to make to Israel uh, and other parties in the region is that ultimately uh, this is something that needs to be resolved diplomatically. And I think the, the issues here are well known. It's very tough to achieve a diplomatic resolution to um, the conflict across the, the blue line as long as there is ongoing conflict in Gaza. And so that's um, uh, not the chief reason, but one of the primary reasons why we continue to push to get a ceasefire in Gaza because of uh, the possibility we believe it would unlock for calm in the north. Not only Gallant, also Netanyahu said that today he told uh, that U.S. envoy that Israel will do what's necessary to ensure its security and safely return the northern residents to their homes. In case Israel decides to enter into war with Hezbollah, what would be your position? So I'm not going to deal with hypotheticals, but certainly we believe that the best way to ensure that Israeli citizens can safely return to their homes in the north uh, is a diplomatic resolution. In the same way we believe a diplomatic resolution is the best way to ensure that the tens of thousands of Lebanese who have been displaced from their homes in southern Lebanon can return home as well. Are there red lines? Uh, I'm just not going to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to um, uh, speculate at all about how this may unfold other than to say we continue to push for a diplomatic resolution and we do fundamentally believe it's in the interests of all the parties. Saeed. Thank you, uh, Matt. You know, but to follow up uh, on this question, uh, basically Hezbollah said that, you know, the best way to have the people return is basically to achieve a ceasefire in Gaza. I think they stated that time and Correct. time again. So. I mean, that, that's a, a caveat there. So, what, 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 I mean, going back to what you said to Humaira on the, 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 the talk, where they are, 
Now, it is said that this week you're going to submit a new proposal. Can you update it? On, on uh, I don't have any update from the answer I gave to Humera okay. five minutes ago, six minutes ago, which is something okay. that, that okay, we but, are working but we, on. But we are looking at a new proposal sometime. Yeah, we are working to, to um, uh, submit a new proposal that we, along with Egypt and Qatar, that uh, hopefully would get us to the finish line. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple more questions. You know, uh, reports say that uh, the medicines in Gaza are just in totally uh, empty. I mean, you know, the stocks of uh, medicines in Gaza are totally empty and the situation is very dire. Can you update us on your effort, you know, uh, in terms of uh, whether it's uh, humanitarian aid or medicines and so on? I mean, especially since the dismantlement or the removal of the pier. Yeah, we continue to work to get uh, medical supplies into Gaza. We know there's a severe shortage of medical supplies there. Uh, it's something that our um, uh, special envoy for humanitarian issues, Lise Grande, works uh, uh, on. Um, and it's, it's, you know, kind of, I'll say we work on that with our international partners, um, uh, chiefly with humanitarian groups. And if you look at the success that we had in the, the last few weeks with uh, unlocking a polio vaccination campaign that has now completed the first round of vaccinations for, I think, 90 percent of Gazan children um, and is moving into the, the second phase of inoculations, um, that is the type of work that we're trying to do with all sorts of medical supplies to make sure that uh, not just food and not just water, which is what people typically focus on. We talk about humanitarian assistance, but also medical <coughs> supplies are making it into Gaza uh, to get uh, in the hands of, of doctors and other health care professionals who need to provide them to their patients. And you think that Israel is doing all it can do to allow supplies in? I think uh, there are certainly a number of issues that we work through all the time, logistical issues, bureaucratic issues, um, and what we work on is trying to unlock those issues wherever they arise, whether they be with the government of Israel, whether they be with the various UN agencies um, that are operating inside Gaza to try to make sure that medicine as well as food and water can get to where it actually needs to go. Matt, I mean, uh, in the last uh, couple of days or three days, the Israelis killed 88 Palestinians in Gaza. I mean, it seems that they have exhausted all targets to achieve their goals. What are their goals at this day? Is it just a, a killing enterprise, just keeping going after, you know, the tents and killing people in tents and so on? And they always have, say, well, they always say there is a Hamas operative and so on. We never really know the fact. But is it worth it to keep killing these innocent people? Now, to go after maybe one Hamas fighter? Let me make clear what we want to see. We want to cease, see a ceasefire. Um, we want to see a ceasefire that brings an end to the suffering of the Palestinian people, people in Gaza. I will let the government of Israel speak to what their military goals are, um, but we have been quite clear that we think the path forward is to get a ceasefire that brings the hostages home, mm -hmm. that stops the daily death and destruction in Gaza, that allows uh, humanitarian assistance to move in in a much uh, improved manner, and that ultimately unlocks the possibility of lasting calm. And a couple more on the settlements, uh, Israel is building a settlement on a, you know, a historic site that, as designated by UNESCO. Are you doing anything, you know, to dissuade, to dissuade Israel from uh, building on this very site? So in we... the next to Bethlehem? Sorry. So, um... As we've said before, settlements are uh, inconsistent with international law. They run counter to efforts to uh, achieve an enduring peace. Our understanding is that this particular settlement uh, that you refer to south of Bethlehem is part of five new settlements that the Israeli cabinet approved in June. You heard us speak out against the, uh, those settlements when they were approved, and we have spoken out against them uh, since then, not just um, publicly, but also privately, in conversations with the senior most uh, members of the Israeli government. Um, ultimately, we think that the settlement program um, doesn't just um, uh, harm the Palestinian people, but it hurts Israel's peace. It hurts Israel's long-term security, and that's what we'll continue to impress upon the government of Israel. And finally, last week when the Israelis uh, raided uh, Janine, the Janine camp, right outside the camp, there's a Hamdan family in a small apartment. They always take their apartment to be a sniping post and so on. They ruined the apartment and so on. They destroyed everything. But, but they also stole uh, Ashraf Hamdan, who's 13 years old. They, sto they stole his PlayStation. You believe that the Israeli army should 
either give him back his PlayStation or compensate him for that. The last I looked, it was like two hundred and seven dollars. So I'm unfamiliar with the facts of yeah. of this case. I don't want to speak to okay. to spe- uh, a specific incident in which I'm right. unfamiliar. But uh, no, obviously, um, a child's PlayStation in any event should not be taken away from them in the first place, and if so, should be returned. So they they should either uh, again, give not, back to him or I, or, so, or compensate. So I'm just telling you, I can't speak to the facts of this case. I've only heard what you've presented to me. But just as a general rule, of course, children's toys should not be taken from them, and if they are taken. And they should be returned. I think that's a pretty safe principle. Yeah. Can I just ask about the West Bank? Um, just go back to the killing of um, American Turkish citizen Aisha Nur Egi from last week because the secretary commented on it while he was traveling. Um, I just want to clarify a couple of things. So the IDF said uh, effectively that it was an accident, but then we had uh, reporting, um, namely Washington Post, um, saying the shots were like taken. Uh, after the peak of the pro- protest. So there are like discrepancies suggesting that perhaps it may not be an accident. What is the U.S. assessment on how she was killed? So we are going to wait the full criminal investigation that the government of Israel has launched before we uh, make any determinations. Obviously, we are reading very closely the eyewitness accounts, and there have been numerous eyewitness accounts of what happened. Um, you heard the secretary speak to those eyewitness accounts when he made his comments in London last week. Um, whether the eyewitness accounts are true, whether the accounts that the Israeli government um, uh, made public are true, ultimately, this is a death that never should have happened. It's a killing that never should have happened. Um, and it's why the secretary made clear that the uh, Israeli security for- forces' rules of engagement need to be changed. So you don't continue to see uh, the killing of unarmed civilians who are doing nothing more than showing up at a peaceful protest. Right. A couple of things there. When do you anticipate this criminal investigation to conclude? I, would, I, I don't have a time to. I would refer to the government of Israel to speak to it. It's ultimately their investigation. Right. But what we have t- said to them is that we want the investigation to be prompt, we want it to be thorough, and we want it to be transparent. And is U.S. considering to launch its own investigation, given she's a U.S. citizen? We're going to await the outcome of this investigation before we make any further determinations. Okay. And has there been any communication with your Israeli counterparts or IDF since Secretary called for a change in their rules of engagement? Have they assured you that they will take it seriously and they will make changes? There have been ongoing communications about this. The same uh, concerns that the Secretary raised publicly we have raised privately to them. Um, those conversations are ongoing, and I don't want to speak to them in any detail at this point. And just um, why, why isn't the U.S. committing to an independent investigation, given that she was a U.S. citizen? Uh, we want to see transparent a transparent investigation, and if accountability is appropriate, we want to see accountability. I think before calling on any further steps, it's appropriate to let the first investigation play out. Now, If the first investigation plays out and we are briefed on the results and we are briefed on the process and we are briefed on the underlying facts and we're not satisfied, we will, of course, look at whether whether any other measures are appropriate. But we think it's appropriate in this instance to wait to let that first investigation play out before we go to any other steps. Okay. one final thing. When you say you guys want this uh, criminal investigation to be conducted promptly, um, this is the case of a U.S. citizen for sure, but we have had similar back and forth about a number of other incidents where there there was uh, civilian harm, um, and then they disappear from the headlines. And um, we don't know what kind of action, if any, or accountability measures have been taken. So I'm wondering, has the United States <coughs> set a timetable um, for when it expects Israel to conclude that, like, what do you mean by prompt? Do you need an answer from them in a couple of weeks, or is it going to be two months? We mean as as soon as possible. I cannot give you a timetable, um, and I think you'll you'll know from covering uh, investigative agencies. Investigative agencies always, I used to work at one and be the spokesperson for one, always have a hard time giving you a timetable for an investigation because you don't know what you're going to find when you start investigating things and how long it's going to take. But we want it to happen as soon as possible, and we want it to be thorough, and we want the results to be transparent. Okay, final, final thing. Can the U.S. commit to seeking accountability uh, for its own citizen on this case? Uh, So it depends what you mean by accountability, right? If there is, uh, if the investigation shows that someone acted inappropriately uh, in violation of the law, in violation of the rules of engagement, in violation of IDF code of conduct, yes, of course we want accountability. Um, But we also want a change 
that will prevent this kind of thing happening again. So you have long-term accountability to ensure that American citizens and others, Palestinians, uh, citizens of other countries, aren't killed just for showing up at a peaceful protest. All right, go ahead. Matt, you said you expect Israel to m m make changes in their rules of engagement. But actually, I remember, actually, there was an interview with Rachel Corey's family last week. And they said, uh, this has been said by Secretary Blinken to Rachel Corey's family before that, you know, Israel already promised uh, make, uh, to make changes to their rules of engagement. And they cited, cited a meeting with Secretary Blinken in, in 2011. So considering that, you know... 2011... 21, uh, maybe. Uh, excuse yeah, me. No, just... <laughs> so, so considering that, you know, there haven't been any change uh, in their rules of engagement, because, I mean, another UN worker was also killed by an, an Israeli sniper after the killing of Aisha or so. There's, there's no, it seems that there's no change in Israel's rules of engagement. Like, what steps... What further steps? So I cannot speak to, to sorry, do? sorry. Uh, I cannot speak to what changes they may or may not have made over the past few years, but any changes that they have made ultimately haven't been sufficient in preventing these kind of incidents from occurring. Um, which is why the secretary said last week that we want to see updates to their rules of engagement. That's what we're going to continue to engage with them. Ultimately, it is the results that matter here. And when you see American citizens and others showing up at peaceful protests and being killed. Um, uh, it is a problem that we want to see addressed. Is that it? I mean, it's just, you know, rule change in their rules of engagement. Is that it all uh, the U.S. expects uh, from Israel regarding the killing of their citizen? So that is, uh, so if there are, um, uh, as I said in response to Humera's question, ultimately if anyone is uh, found to behave in violation of the law, in violation of uh, code of conduct, we want to see accountability as well. But the, and when it comes to changes for rules of engagement, what we mean is, to, is not just accountability for this uh, killing, but steps to prevent similar killings from happening in the and future. Also, there have been, uh, you know, criticisms uh, from a lot of people, including including Aishanur's family, that you has the, the U.S.'s response to Aishanur's killing has been very slow and in in uh, insufficient. And uh, there were reports over the weekend that no U.S. officials have attended her family. Can you confirm these reports? And if this is accurate, can you explain why? So first of all, I will say that I um, uh, cannot understand the pain um, that her family uh, is going through right now and how horrific it must be to lose a loved one in these circumstances and our hearts truly do go out to them. Um, I want to be respectful of their privacy in this situation. We have been in communication with her family on a number of occasions um, uh, over the past week or so, and I think it's appropriate for us to keep those communications private. So you can't tell us whether or not any U.S. officials have attended? We have been in communication with her family, and as I said, I think I'll keep those communications private. Yeah. On this, you know, when Richard Corey was killed, you know, in March 2003, the Israelis came back in 2012. Then, you know, when Shina Bakla was killed, on, you know, in May, and then they came back on July 4th and they said it was unintentional. And this time around, the Israelis are saying that, you know, it was a bullet that ricocheted and so on, which seems to, you know, be accepted in, in fact, the president. Right? So is the case closed as so, far as the, the, the U.S. Uh, government so is concerned? It is very much uh, not closed. And I think if you listen to the comments from... Mm -hmm. Uh, the secretary and other U.S. government officials last week, what we said is even accepting the announced results of the preliminary investigation, even if you accept that as fact for what happened, it still shows that this is a killing that never should have happened. And that's why we want to see changes in Israel's rule of, rules of engagement to prevent such killings from happening again in the future. Thank you. Yeah, Alex, Thank you. Good. I'll come to you next. From your uh, OPRIC statement. You said that these actions on Georgia uh, come as a result of our ongoing comprehensive review um, of the bi bilateral relationship. Uh, since you haven't finalized your review yet, uh, does that mean that today's sanctions are just a second tranche of multi-layer uh, measures that you are going to take? So I, I don't know if I would say second, because there are a few different ways to look at this. You saw us impose, uh, when we announced the review in the first place, you saw us impose visa restrictions on a number of Georgian government officials for their uh, anti-democratic actions. And you also saw us announce that we would review our security funding. And subsequent to that, we've announced that we have, not security funding, our overall funding to the government of Georgia. And uh, subsequent to that, you have seen us announce that we have suspended $95 million uh, in funding uh, to the government of Georgia. Um, and the 
uh, review about other U.S. government funding is ongoing. In terms of visa restrictions, you made it clear that you will not name the name. I, I get that. Correct. But uh, given the disinformation campaign that the government in Georgia has been launching you know, to dismiss your uh, you know, sanctions, previous sanctions, wouldn't that be much more effective to point fingers at the violators? Well, naming the yeah, Alex, you are welcome to go to the United States Congress and ask the lobby to them to change the law to allow us to uh, name uh, the people on whom we've opposed visa restrictions. But until that law is changed, we're unable to do so. But let, me, let me try. So I, if you want to make the effective case, you're, uh, no, no, you're, that, that, you're barking that, up the wrong tree. No offense. That, that's fair. But let me try different. You, you sanctioned last time 20 plus uh, assuming MPs. And this time you, you, you stuck with 60 um, assuming uh, MPs. Some 80 plus uh, you know, uh, pro Russian MPs voted for a Russian law. Uh, is it fair to expect that all of those MPs are now banned from uh, the US? I'm not going to preview any actions at all other than to say that our review, both of potential other accountability actions and uh, other uh, tranches of funding, remains ongoing. Let me also get your reaction to their latest campaign. The uh, uh, Georgian government uh, is trying to convince the world that it was Georgia uh, backed by the US. Uh, that started a war with Russia in 2008, not the other way around. If you put that in the context, what, 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 what was the takeoff? Uh, yeah, I saw the comments. I would just say simply, um, I don't think Georgia needs to apologize for having been invaded by Russia any more than Georgia needs to apologize for uh, the fact that Russia continues to illegally occupy 20% of Georgian territory. It is Russia that has been the aggressor in invading Georgia and continuing to illegally occupy Georgia as Russia has been the aggressor with other countries in the region, of course, um, uh, Ukraine being uh, a very prominent example of that. And, and I want to uh, call to Aliyev today. Uh, the Secretary also spoke with Armenia's Prime Minister last week. Is he hoping to put together another uh, you know, meeting in New York? So I don't have any announcements to make. Obviously, we always um, uh, look for opportunities to convene um, uh, the foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan. We continue to support the efforts of both countries to reach a durable and dignified peace agreement. They have made significant progress towards finalizing a peace agreement, and we're committed to supporting them uh, in any way that we can, including um, uh, convening a meeting if that's helpful. I have one more Iran, if I may. Uh, today, uh, you guys joined a statement uh, with other countries uh, you know, in, in terms of two years uh, you know, uh, after Masa I and mean, Minis' death, you guys have a law to impose sanctions, and other countries have done so. Why, why not using this momentum to announce the sanctions today? Uh, so uh, we have announced uh, over uh, sanctions on I think it's over uh, 500 Iranian entities and individuals since the outset of this administration. You've seen us in just the last few weeks announce additional sanctions on Iranian entities and individuals. Some of those uh, sanctions have been for uh, human rights abuses, repeated human rights abuses. Um, and I think you've seen a pretty consistent pattern that shows our record here, but I don't want to preview uh, any uh, upcoming actions. But you're behind in terms of implementation of MASA Act. The congressional report we, hasn't been filed yet, as far as I understand. We, can, I we continue to work on that report, and when it comes to other actions, stay tuned. Thank you. Frank, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the White House has not contacted Ishinor Egi's family 10 days out from her killing. Eyewitnesses themselves tell us that they actually haven't been reached out to for any Israeli-led investigation. Our colleagues at the Washington Post, of course, as you might have seen, reported footage and testimony that seemed to reveal that the Israeli military misled the U.S. and the world in its initial findings of how and when Ishinor was shot. When is the president, vice president, going to reach out to Aishinor's family? And how can the U.S. continue deferring to Israel to investigate itself for killing an American if it has already at best misled and at worst lied in its preliminary findings? And how also given it hasn't reached out to eyewitnesses? So as I said, first of all, with respect to um, her family, which we know are, um, uh, experience, are experiencing this horrific tragedy, uh, the U.S. government has had a number of conversations with right, her family. Just I, I, hold on, I just, let me just let me say, I, I just it is not public appropriate for me to get into those publicly. I, don't, I never would in a situation like this, and I'm not I'm not going to here. Um, but we have reached out to express our deepest uh, condolences. Um, I will say, when it comes to the investigation. Um, I cannot speak for the investigation that's occurring now, other than to say we are going to expect it to be prompt, thorough, and transparent. And if it's not, and I don't think anyone should draw conclusions about invest an investigation while it's ongoing, but at the end of it, 
we will certainly be happy to look at how the investigation was conducted, what it produced, if there are any deficiencies, and if um, we don't find that it meets our standards, we'll have more to say at the time. But is it not a red flag that the initial findings are already being discredited by testimony and footage? So I think I already said, uh, you heard me say earlier, even if you accept the initial findings, they don't present an acceptable outcome. Right? You, look, you look at the initial findings, and they already tell you that something went tragically wrong, uh, and you had the killing of an American citizen that never should have occurred. So when I hear people say, the, you know, the, uh, uh, sort of hold, hold the initial findings up as if they somehow exonerated uh, Israeli security forces, they very much do not. In, at least in our point of view, they very much do not exonerate them. They reveal the need for uh, a number of changes, and we've made clear that's what needs to happen. But then when it comes to uh, what ultimately happened and getting to the bottom of what ultimately happened, let's see how the investigation plays out. I do think we shouldn't draw any conclusions before it's final. Um, uh, and when we see the ultimate investigation, we'll have more to say based on um, our assessment of it. And then finally, just on what you've said that the U.S. is urging the Israeli forces to modify, change its rules of engagement after Eisenhower's killing. Of course, there's also World Central Kitchen worker Jacob Flickinger, the teenagers Mohammed Kadur, Taufik Abdul-Jabbar. Our journalist colleague, Shirin Abu Akla, peace activist Rachel Corey, 40,000 Palestinians, which, of course, you've condemned as well, the, the killing of them. The logic would follow that the U.S. has unconditionally funded a military with evidently insufficient rules of engagement up to this point. So is there any U.S. reflection on that idea? The U.S. reflection on it is that, that Israel needs to change its policies, and we have made that quite clear. Uh, when it comes to the world's central kitchen strike, we made uh, clear that they need to, to change their deconfliction measures and worked with the U.N. to get new deconfliction measures in place. Now, those aren't perfect. Uh, we continue to see uh, strikes that, that result in the death of humanitarian workers. Um, we continue to see strikes in Gaza that um, lead to the uh, uh, tragic, tragic deaths of civilians. As you know, it's a, it is a very difficult place in which to conduct a military campaign because you have a terrorist organization that embeds itself uh, and hides itself behind civilians, which is why it's the United States that is at the forefront of pushing for a ceasefire. And when it comes to actions in the West Bank, it's the, why it's the United States that's pushing for changes to the US, to Israeli rules of engagement. As you point out, those attacks have still continued. So if these urgings don't continue, will there not be a consideration to condition weapons? We continue to work to get the best outcome possible. And we believe the best outcome possible when you look in Gaza is a ceasefire. So and that's why, hold on, let me, just, let, me just, let me just answer the question. Um, and it's why we continue to work with Egypt and with Qatar to get a ceasefire fire over the line. Ultimately, we think that is the thing that would bring an alleviation to the suffering of the Palestinian people. Not any of the other steps we, we hear um, uh, bandied about from time to time, uh, but a ceasefire that brings a lasting end to the war. When it comes to changes in the West Bank, it's the changes that we've proposed with others. Uh, Kylie, go ahead. Just to follow up quickly on that, yeah. you, you said that deconfunction isn't perfect. perfect. Um, is it the U.S. assessment at this point that the Israelis are doing the best that they can and they've implemented some changes? Uh, when it comes to deconfliction with NGOs? I'm sure that there are always changes that uh, further refinements that can be made. I mean, the, the, the problem that you have, and we, we've seen this over and over when it comes to um, uh, incidents with humanitarian workers, is um, the government of Israel puts in place with the humanitarian aid groups a new set of deconfliction measures, uh, and then you have an incident that exposes a flaw in one of them. You saw this recently with the strike uh, against um, uh, a convoy where the lead vehicle, um, uh, I think uh, I'll get the details wrong, but, but left the convoy, turned around, and was ultimately fired upon um, by Israel security forces. You get, diff you get different things, where you get different incidents that expose new problems that need to be solved. Ultimately, I don't, this isn't unique to th this. This particular deconfliction problem is not unique to Gaza. It's something that tends to be the case in ongoing war zones where you have the difficulty of delivering humanitarian assistance while there is ongoing fighting. Now, of course, it is made even more acute because of the unique problem in Gaza of Hamas hiding itself behind uh, human shields. Um, but that's why we continue to work. It is really, in, really through an ongoing process. Um, with the humanitarian groups, with the UN, and with Israel to try to get the best possible deconfliction but measures it, in place. And it remains the U.S. assessment at this time that Israel is genuinely working to perfect those deconfliction channels. There is always more that they can do, and we continue to, to engage with them about improvements that, that they can make uh, on an ongoing basis. Okay, and then just if we can pivot to Ukraine for a minute with the Secretary's yeah. visit. Um, last week, he came out of that visit saying that he and his UK counterpart would be presenting their findings with regard to 
the Ukrainians asked to strike deeper into Russia um, and whether or not, you know, there would be a policy decision on that would hinge on President Biden's meeting with Prime Minister Starmer on Friday. That meeting is concluded. We haven't heard anything from you guys. So where does that conversation stand? Has there been a policy decision on that ask from the Ukrainians yet? So first of all, um, you're right. The secretary did say he would discuss his conversations um, uh, with President Zelensky and other Ukrainian uh, leaders, but he said he discussed them with the president, not with all of you. Um, uh, and he did do that on Friday. And of course, we know that they, um, uh, uh, the prime minister was here to discuss um, uh, their policy as well with the president. Um, I don't have any announcements to make about changes in our policy today. We can continue to engage with our Ukrainian uh, partners about the best way that they can support them to ensure that they win this war, the best way we can provide them with uh, capabilities and intelligence support uh, and other support, uh, and that um, uh, will continue to be our commitment, but I don't have any announcements to make on policy. But it's still pos possible that the policy could change, or you guys have decided to keep it intact the way it is? I don't have any announcements to, to make today. We always, and this is just a general statement that covers um, uh, uh, our policy when it comes to Ukraine engage with the Ukrainians about what they need and how best we can support them. And as I know you've all heard the Secretary say many times, adapt and adjust those policies as necessary to best support them in a way that uh, makes strategic sense uh, and provides them capabilities that they can actually use and that they can support and that they're trained on. Uh, and that will continue to be our policy going forward. So you don't think they need to strike deeper inside Russia right now? Uh, I said I don't have any announcements to make about changes today. Um, yeah, Hiba, go ahead about the investigation. Does yeah. this apply to all your allies when a U.S. citizen is killed? You don't interfere, you wait until the investigation, is the outcome of the investigation. Sorry, what, and sorry. whether it is repeated, and if the incident was repeated many times. So I'm not going to deal with a, a hypothetical about going forward, but it would always depend on the circumstance. If we saw an ally that was conducting an investigation, or in this case, bless you, um, conducted an initial investigation, briefed us on the results, and said they were conducting a full investigation, we would certainly take that into consideration in what steps we might take. Um, but that's not to foreclose any further steps on our end if we think it's appropriate and necessary at a later time. Yeah, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, quick question. Do you have any comment or update about the second assassination attempt on uh, former President Trump while he golf, play golf yesterday? Yes, as you heard the, the president say, we deplore violence of all kind. There's no place in the United States uh, for political violence. That's not how we settle our political disputes in this country. No update. I, the U.S. Uh, the State Department is not the investigating agency. I would refer you to the, the FBI. Gotcha. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. A couple of questions. Today, Ambassador Under Secretary Bass was uh, in Pakistan meeting Army Chief, Deputy Prime Minister, and a couple of other people, and they spoke about economy and security. Uh, did they speak about democracy or Imran Khan at all? Or no? <clears throat> So they discussed our approaches to expanding uh, bilateral cooperation on economic and security issues, including uh, countering terrorism and violent extremism, the importance of fostering regional stability and prosperity. Um, this undersecretary expressed, expressed his gratitude for Pakistan's continued op uh, uh, cooperation in assisting Afghans in resettlement pathways to the United States, uh, and we will continue to work closely with the government of Pakistan on all these issues. Uh, the following two questions are about journalism. The other day, the secretary spoke, uh, and Mr. Uh, uh, James Rubin spoke in detail about the Russian media, RT, and all these things. Um, now, don't you think that China, because last year, from what I remember, Mr. Rubin saying was that China is the one that spends the most money in propaganda, in fake news. Uh, did I miss something here? Like, don't you think China is the one that should have been targeted or their uh, fake news and outlets should have been targeted? I, I, I don't think you should have seen Friday's announcement as any kind of exclusive announcement about one country only at the expense of others. We made clear we uh, oppose uh, countries all around the world um, using disinformation um, to um, uh, mislead American citizens, citizens of other countries, and we'll continue to work to, uh, to counter that. Just one more about yeah. uh, a couple of times I have reminded you about Arshid Sharif, a journalist as well. Last week, his wife uh, uh, showed the details that it was not just a natural shooting. His body had 12 
uh, wound marks on different areas. This is the podium where people raise uh, the issues of those journalists who are either, uh, uh, you know, uh, swallowed by these hyenas uh, for their political gains or different establishments uses uh, their lives and plays with them. We come to you to ask for their support. Anything you can say further about this journalist uh, and his investigation the U.S. could do? I don't have any assessment with this particular case. Obviously, we support the free exercise of journalism all around the world, Michelle. Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, why did the U.S. Uh, move uh, f uh, or decide to move forward with all the U.S. aid to Egypt uh, without the restrictions that it applied in the past uh, uh, for human rights concerns? So when we look at the, the foreign military financing that the United States provides to the government of Egypt, um, we assess it under a number of different factors. Uh, Egypt has played a, an important role over the past year um, uh, in helping try to get to further regional stability. We've seen, seen them play a really critical role in trying to get a ceasefire uh, across the line in Gaza. We've also seen some improvements in the human rights situation in Egypt when it comes to the introduction of a bill uh, uh, regarding pre-trial detention. When it comes to the release of some uh, political prisoners. We do need to see further advancements on human rights, and that's what we're going to continue to push with the government of Egypt. Um, uh, but that's, those are the factors that we took into consideration when, when we made this decision. And one on Iraq, do you have any updates on the U.S. Uh, military withdrawal from there? Uh, from, the from, from Iraq, you said? Yes. Um, uh, I don't. Um, we held, as you know, we've held a number of discussions with the government of Iraq this year on the future of uh, our forces there, including when the, the prime minister was in Washington and met with the president in April. We have um, made clear with them that um, we will take into a fact uh, that we would review with the government of, of Iraq a number of factors to determine when and how the mission of the global coalition uh, in Iraq would end and transition in an orderly manner to an ongoing uh, bilateral security partnership in accordance with the Iraq's constitution and the U.S.-Iraq strategic framework agreement. Uh, and those conversations, those discussions are ongoing. Yeah, go ahead, and then I'll come to Sean. The Iraqi government says that the deal for the end the coalition missions in Iraq. Is there any deal drafted between you and Iraq to this matter? I don't have any update to, uh, to the answer I just gave Michelle, which is that the discussions between our two countries are ongoing. And I have two more questions on Iraq, if sure. I may. Yeah. Then there are, there are reports that are telling that Iraqi government officials allowed both Hamas and Houthis to open their offices in Baghdad. While you are requesting Iraq to rein the Iranian-backed groups in Iraq, we see that they are allowing other groups like Houthis to open their offices in Baghdad and establishing their permanent presence in Baghdad. Do you have any reaction to this? Yeah, let me be very clear. Hamas and the Houthis are terrorist organizations. And um, Hamas and the Houthis being allowed to operate in Iraq uh, only risks incre increasing the number of armed groups that have an interest in under using violence to undermine the government of Iraq's goals for stability, sovereignty, and economic growth. Um, we support a stable and secure Iraq. The presence of these groups in Iraq risks bringing Iraq into deep regional conflicts, uh, and we have shared these concerns directly with the government of Iraq. And last week, uh, Iranian-backed group has attacked a U.S. diplomat facilities in Baghdad, in which the embassy in Baghdad said in a statement, these groups are operating freely in Baghdad. So it's been multiple times you have requested Iraq to make these groups responsible for their acts. So why the Iraqi government is not doing this? Do you think that they are capable but not doing it, or they are incapable to do this? I'm not going to speak to um, uh, the Iraqi government's actions, other than to say that we do expect them to uh, hold accountable anyone who um, uh, takes that action against U.S. personnel, U.S. forces in the region. Uh, let me go to the back and then I'll come I'll finish the shot. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could give us an update on the detention of American citizens in Venezuela and also if you are in the government is engaged in any type of talks to work for their release. So we can confirm the detention of uh, one U.S. military member in Venezuela, and then, of course, we've seen the reports of two additional U.S. citizens detained in Venezuela. Um, 
we are seeking additional information and monitoring the situation. Uh, and I don't have any further comment at this you, time. You cannot confirm the reports on the two additional cities? Uh, we have seen the reports of them. Okay. Obviously, this is a, uh, a situation where we don't exactly have a close relationship with the uh, government of Venezuela, but we are continuing to gauge to try to gather more, uh, to gather additional information. And then on that, there were also Spanish citizens arrested. And I wanted to ask you if you've been in contact with the government of Spain about it. And if you think this decision has been linked to the fact that the Spanish government granted asylum to Edmundo González Urrutia? Uh, so uh, I, I can't speak to any direct conversations between the U.S. government and Spain. It's not to say that they haven't been happening. Uh, I would suspect they are. I'm just not aware of them, and so I can't speak to them. Um, but I would just say we have seen, and, and I wouldn't speculate as to why Venezuela is taking these actions, other than we have seen them make uh, a number of false claims over the past few days about the reason for their uh, detention, and I think I'll leave it at that. So and, and sorry, just yeah. to, so just going back, you are the U.S. is not doing anything to kind of get these people released mm. from Venezuela. No, uh, that is not what I said. There are privacy considerations that we have to respect when it comes to individuals. Um, uh, uh, I think the the other people in the briefing room have gotten tired of me, uh, of hearing me say it over time, but. Uh, in a number of cases, when we don't have a privacy release, it's uh, difficult for us to talk about the details of an, uh, an underlying case, and that's the, the situation here. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is the U.S. position in Israel's uh, insistence to remain in control of the Philadelphia Corridor, which is fundamental point in the negotiations? In so, now, this is something that we have spoken to uh, a number of times. Obviously, Israel does have very real security concerns, and we think that those security concerns can be addressed. Um, we think that they are addressed in the ceasefire proposal that the president laid out on May 31st, as well as the bridging proposal that we put forward uh, in recent weeks, and we're continuing to try to work through um, uh, how to implement that ceasefire in a way that would ensure uh, Israel's security, uh, as well as um, alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian. Uh, what's happening uh, for the port? The, the temporary report, it, it was built uh, ex exclusively to uh, provide humanitarian aid and food for the people in Gaza. We don't hear anything about it. Is food and humanitarian aid used as a tool to pressure on Hamas? So I, uh, um, I can't speak to why you don't hear anything about it. I can never speak to coverage decisions made by the press. I can tell you we continue to work on it. It continues to be something that we are incredibly focused on, trying to get uh, humanitarian assistance in. Um, uh, we are seeing food and water and medicine, um, but ultimately, 11 months into this conflict, um, you have to step back and, and, and draw the conclusion that the way to get the massive amount of humanitarian assistance that we need to get in is through a ceasefire um, that would make it easier to get humanitarian assistance in and make it easier for it to move around uh, and get delivered to the people who need it. All right, Sean, the more wrap for today. Um, good follow up. Um, uh, Assistant Secretary Liu, I believe, is in Bangladesh. Is or was? Um, do you have any readouts of his meetings? And uh, more broadly speaking, in terms of the the interim government, with dealing with Muhammad Yunus, and uh, how how does the U.S. assess uh, where where Bangladesh is going? And, and also, I believe there's an announcement of U.S. aid um, assistance there. What's what's the goal of that? Yeah. So the uh, Assistant Secretary Liu uh, has been in Dhaka. Uh, he met with key advisors to the Bangladeshi interim government to discuss how. The United States can support Bangladesh's economic growth, financial stability, and government governance and development needs. Um, while he was there, uh, along with representatives from USAID, they announced, or I'm sorry, we signed with the Bangladesh Bangladeshi interim government a development agreement worth over $200 million in interim assistance, which will support um, govern governance, expanding straight, uh, trade, and creating greater opportunities for the Bangladeshi people to build a brighter and more prosperous future. I have a follow-up on that. Sean, you finish with the floor? Please, please. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. We'll wrap there. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, the, uh, the repair. present context in Bangladesh, already I got one. The, I have two uh, small questions. Uh, let me go with the Islamist jihadist Mufti Joshimuddin Ramani, chief of the Al-Qaeda-inspired militant outfit and other militant uh, kingpin uh, from Harkatul Jihad and Hizbut Tahiri, uh, and also uh, Interpol wanted terrorist uh, like uh, Sweden Islam, Iman, and many more released from jail. Could this uh, disturb the U.S. engagement to combat, uh, combat terrorism in Southeast Asia? Let me take that question back. And, and then uh, with the Indian Navy upcoming high-level meeting on Tuesday addressing the Bangladesh crisis and potential, uh, potential uh, Chinese uh, uh, potential Chinese strategies in the region, what is the U.S. 
pers uh, perspective on the evolving situation. How is the U.S. coordinating with the regional partner, uh, particularly with India, to ensure stability and address concerning related to Chinese influence on the region? Uh, let me take that one back as well, and we'll end. Yeah, yeah, Matt, go ahead. If you've seen that Chairman McCall has called as um, scheduled a, a markup for I have. the yeah. resolution holding the secretary to hold the secretary in contempt of Congress. What do you have to say about uh, that? Anything? I, th I think that step is completely unnecessary. Uh, the secretary has already testified before Congress uh, about Afghanistan 14 times. He has testified before Chairman McCall's committee four times. One of those appearances was to talk only about Afghanistan. It was at a hearing exclusively focused on Afghanistan. Uh, when the committee was conducting its review of our policy and comparing and, and compiling this report, we provided a number of figures, or I'm sorry, a number of officials from the department to testify before the committee and provide it, it information, as well as turning over thousands of pages of documents. And when it comes to the secretary's testimony, um, uh, he's not available to testify, just isn't from a scheduling perspective, on the dates that the chairman wanted him to be there. And so we made him two offers. Uh, one is that the deputy secretary could come and testify on that date. And two, uh, if that wasn't acceptable, we would make the secretary available on a later date to come and testify. And uh, for some reason, and uh, I can't speculate what it was, the chairman decided to decline both of those offers and move forward with this um, contempt markup, which short circuits any type of debate between the State Department uh, and, has and his committee, rather than accept our offer to come testify uh, uh, before them. So. so you're not a fan? Uh, <laughs> I don't think this step was in any way necessary or productive, given the uh, tremendous steps we have taken to provide the committee with the information it needs to conduct its oversight purposes. Um, Secretary was ready to testify at a later date. We were ready to have someone there on the date that they proposed. Uh, for whatever reason, neither of those alternatives were good enough to them, so they chose to take this step. Um, we will continue to work with them uh, when we can productively do so, but um, uh, they will have to make their own decisions about how they move right. forward. You want to explain, tell us why the secretary can't be there on Thursday? Uh, I don't have any announcements to make today. We'll end there. Thanks, everyone.